Hello everyone, this is Dr. Doug Graham here to present a webinar on Culinary Skills Week. Wow your friends with your food. How many times have you just wished you could impress your friends with your food? How many times has your family come over or you gone to them and you just wished, man if I could, if they only understood what I understand, I know I've got to reach out to them with my food and I just they don't get all that excited when you just peel a banana and eat it. Now I understand I still get excited to peel a banana and you might too. But learning how to present brilliant, excellent, delicious, eye-catching, taste bud catching, every sense pleasing food is an art, a science, and a philosophy. Tonight, I'm going to spend a little time helping you learn how to wow your friends with your food, go through some material that I believe is important for everyone in the raw food 80-10-10 camp to fully understand. I'm going to give you some bonus information that we did even tell you about just because I like to give you a little extra and we're going to do everything we can to custom cater this webinar to your needs and to help us do that I'd like to take or I'd like to offer you a short poll a question tell us why you're here What's the reason? I'll give you some choices. They're over on the right side of your screen, and you just tick the box. Let me know why you're here. A little later through the seminar or through this webinar, I'll be able to tell you how those numbers panned out so that you know where you stand compared to everybody else and whether Culinary Skills Week is really for you. That's why we're here tonight. Do you want a week full of the type of information that we'll be sharing tonight? So without further ado, please take your poll, let us know, and I will begin customizing the presentation to meet your preferences. One of the biggest issues people have told me about when attempting to learn 80-10-10 from a position of not a lot of experience is that they have no idea how much food to keep in the house. There are a lot of possibilities that affect the answer, but there are some generalities as well. Let's look at what can affect the answer first and how it might and then we can look at some of the general guidelines. A lot of people say, you know, when I'm, when I'm home, I find this program really easy. And when I'm on the road, I find it really hard. But just as many people have come to me and said, when I'm on the road, away from my family, I can eat exactly what I want, and I do really great on this program but when I go home and I have all those other influences of people at my house that aren't eating the way I am I cave and I don't do well I think those people need to meet each other and share their solutions but at the same time a lot of people say you know I do really well and then I look around the house and there's nothing to eat the bananas are still green and who wants to eat just lettuce and and there's nothing else and there's no other fruit and it's winter and the fruit doesn't taste that good or it's autumn and it's not the best time of year or it's spring and it's even more gloomy in terms of food availability what do we have to do to make this work well depending on where you live the answers are somewhat different. In a rural environment where you might 
only shop once or twice a week because it's a trip and a trek, you need to have at least seven to ten days worth of food. However much food you eat in a day, you need to have at least that much food on hand as a general guideline. Whereas in the city where you might shop every day, there still needs to be some food in the house, but nowhere near as much. Two, three, four days worth of food. Five days if you want to really be prepared. But usually you can go down to the street every day and pick up a little bit of food and keep the cycle rolling pretty much daily or every other day. And you don't need to have anywhere near as much variety available in your house. The stores can keep the fresh stuff coming. Makes it easier for you in terms of greens. And all around, you have to see. Now, most people these days live in the city, and they might be able to get away with a bit less. But still, we're not, if you just have today's food in the house, you're going to run out. You're going to run out. It's going to be a problem. Of course, what's in season makes a big difference. And what season it is determines that. To a great degree, sure, you can get mangoes every day of the year if you're willing to pay for them. And you can get autumn fruit in the spring if you're willing to buy it from South America or from Africa. But if you want the freshest and the best of the food, the time of year definitely makes a difference because there are certain foods, such as persimmon, that you might only see in November and December. Well, It's an interesting thing because, because persimmon is a food that, um, how do we say, persimmon is a food that has a tremendously long, tremendously long window of when it's available to you. It's available in terms of once it ripens for weeks. You can take a perfectly ripe persimmon, put it in your fridge, come back a month later, and it will still be good. It'll still be excellent, maybe even better than it was when you first thought it was ripe. Whereas there's lots of food where you only get a few days. If it's persimmon season and I want the persimmon availability to last, I could have... 20 trays of persimmon in my house and spread those out over the next three months. I've done the same thing with tomatoes at the end of tomato season where I'll have eight weeks worth of tomatoes in my house and as they come ripe I keep them in a relatively cool place. I control the ripening process a little bit slow it down as much as I can without having them go bad or lose flavor. And that, you know, it throws the whole average off when we say, oh, you only need three days worth of food in the house. Well, here I've got the next three months worth of food in the house in terms of tomatoes and persimmon. With greens, I only want as short an amount as possible. I want to keep getting fresh greens. And so we want to look Apples keep a long time. Pears keep an incredibly long time. And with each food, we're going to have to choose how we go about how much of it is in the house. Some foods ripen up very slowly, and you never want to run out. Say, bananas. I always have a week's worth of bananas in the house, sometimes 10 or 12 days' worth of bananas in my house. And that's a lot of bananas. But unless I do, I'm just as likely to run out of ripe bananas, a situation I don't want to have happen, as I am to be able to meter it just closely enough. So the seasons and what's in season makes a difference in your choices of how much food you're going to keep in your house. Of course, space is an issue. Your ability to store the food and how long it will store. You can find out how to store food 
by asking your produce manager. He'll probably or she'll probably tell you pretty clearly, well, these are the instructions we've got for this, that, or the next food. And we know we can keep apples at a certain temperature for a long time, and you can keep bananas. I mean, you can keep apples colder than you keep tomatoes, and they'll be just happy as could be. Whereas tomatoes will, you can keep them a long time if you keep them cold, but they lose their flavor. Who wants that? And so it might be a good idea, if you have the possibility, to have more than one place where you store your food. Maybe one place is very cool and one place is fairly warm. And you can change it up as you need be. As I mentioned already with greens, I want them as fresh as I can possibly get them. I want to keep them fresh and make them happen. I want the turnover to be a lot of turnover. I don't want to buy a week's worth of greens. The they just won't keep for a week. They won't have that same flavor. And so I might make an extra trip to the store. I'd be certainly be willing to make an extra trip to the store to just go get some more greens rather than try to buy a lot all at once. So individual foods, you're going to have to choose which and which and how much do you want to have in the house. But I'll tell you what, you're better off to have too much than you are to have too little. If you have too little, you bump into problems. You can predict problems. Whereas if you have too much, well, you could eat a little more of whatever you have too much of. You could invite some friends over to help you eat the food, especially if you can make it into something that will wow them. You could freeze it if it's a freezable product, or dry it if it's a dryable product. If it has to, it makes really good compost. And so there are so many different ways to deal with too much. But too little? <laughs> you have too little and you bumped into a problem. And so we don't want that to happen. We're going to keep plenty of food coming your way. Keep plenty of food in the house. You're better off with too much than you are with too little. Now tonight I promised to talk to you a bit about my favorite kitchen tools and I want to get right into that for you. And maybe there's no surprise, I promised my five favorite kitchen tools. I made a list of at least five and I'm, I'm sure you'll... Don't count, okay? Don't count. I, if you ask me my favorite five fruits, I can put 10 or 15 into that list too. But I'll tell you the tool that I use a lot it's called a julienne peeler. Now, what a julienne peeler does, it usually either has little teeth or little holes. There's several different styles of julienne peelers. And what they affect is the shape of what they peel. You might get square shape if you have little teeth. You'll get circles. And, and depending on the texture, the size of the openings will determine the size of what you end up getting. So for a julienne peeler, there are many, many different kinds of those. The type I like is just a little handheld peeler. It's not the same as a cucumber peeler, just a straight slice. What it does is it ends up making something that looks like noodles. I'm a real fan of noodles, so I might use a julienne peeler on my cucumber to make cucumber skin noodles or cucumber noodles. I like cucumber skin noodles. I make soups with cucumber skin. I make sandwiches with cucumber skin. I put them sometimes in the salad as an extra texture within the salad, and it's just cucumber skin. Cut and noodles. It's, it's fascinating. And most people are surprised to find out how good the skins are, the part that they would usually just throw away. Now, I like the skins. And they make a good dish all by themselves. And of course, the cucumber itself is excellent. You can julienne peel harder vegetables, such as a butternut squash or even a pumpkin, to make noodles that are quite delicious. So there's lots of ways to use the julienne peeler, and it's 
definitely one of my favorite tools. I like that it's so portable and quiet. And I can use it whenever I travel. I'm a fan of the Vitamix blender. I highly recommend the Vitamix blender. If you have to choose which blender you're going to buy next, I recommend the Vitamix blender. And if you ever want to say that I sent you to buy your Vitamix blender, you get a special price. That's cool too. But I am a fan of Vitamix blender and I've tried most of the most of the different blenders that are out on the market. I used to buy cheap blenders. I'd buy a $20 blender knowing full well that if it broke down I could bring it back to the store. One day I brought four blenders back. I had one, broke it, broke the next when I got the return, broke the next. On the fourth one I felt a little funny but I still brought it back but I didn't buy another one. I said I wonder what would happen if I spend a little more money and just buy one. Why do I have to keep going through blenders that don't work? I bought my Vitamix. I bought my Vitamix, gosh, 30 years ago. It's still cranking. And I've tested it now and then. I've worked it pretty hard. And it's still just going strong. I own several Vitamix blenders now. And I stand by them firmly. I've bought a lot of the other very expensive blenders and have found for various reasons that I didn't like them as well as just the I think I think the Vitamix is the standard by which all other blenders are measured for me the Vitamix is great now I, I like to put things in the Vitamix in order to start with frozen things and make something close to the texture of ice cream I mean it is very creamy if you start with bananas, but if you start with mangoes or peaches, you're going to come up with something that is more of a sorbet. It's an icier texture. I enjoy putting vegetables in the blender and leaving the blender on high for a whole minute until it warms up close to body temperature, at which point I can have a warm soup and enjoy that very much. I take the Vitamix and sometimes the food piles up on itself, it gets wedged, it gets lodged and yes there's a pushing tool that you can use to help but sometimes I have to just take the Vitamix off of its stand, off its base and tap it, tap the bottom of it onto the tabletop, bang 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 put it back on, everything's fallen in, you put it back on. The Vitamix blender pulls air down and we'll talk about other blenders that don't do that a little later on because although it's incredibly efficient at blending, the Vitamix blender definitely pulls air into your food and, and it aerates it which means that some of the oxygen sensitive nutrients are affected. Now, if you eat the food right away, we're really not talking about any issue at all because even chewing has that same effect. But if you leave the food for 8 hours or 24 hours, that oxidizing factor makes the food just a little bit less nutritious and depending on the food can really be a negative feature which is another reason that I'm always recommending that we eat fresh food. I don't even know how many different kinds of food processors there are out on the market most of the good ones are really excellent. I like many of the attachment blades and I use a lot of different blades on my food processor. Yes, I like the Julian blade. But I also use the S blade a tremendous amount. I use the S blade to make sauces. I use the S blade to make crushed vegetables take celery or carrot and put it on the S blade 
lettuce on the S blade, cauliflower on the S blade, and you end up with really small little bits. You can control how big, from grain of sand to grain of rice size. And depending on the texture that you're hoping to present in the food that you're making, you can control this so that it'll come out the way you want. There are many different blades. It makes, I mean, the food processor is exactly the way it sounds, right? It allows you to process food at high speed with a lot less effort, a lot less mess, and certainly a lot less time than you could ever do it with a knife. Now, if you're good with a knife, one of my favorite tools, a good knife, I use my knife every day for a lot of things. You can turn it, the blade on its side, put a walnut or a macadamia nut under it, tap your fist on top of the flat blade, and you end up with crushed nuts. If you keep your knife sharp, you can cut with great precision. I may be a little over the top with this, but I sharp if it's the first time of the day that I'm using a knife I sharpen it I sharpen it every day and at that point it only takes two or three strokes either with a sharpening tool such as you're looking at here or with a sharpening tool that does both edges at the same time and two or three strokes it's sharp and noticeably different than if I don't take those two or three strokes The idea with a knife is to be able to handle a knife that you can control, that you feel comfortable with. A bigger knife isn't better if you can't control it, if you don't feel that you're totally at ease wielding such a big blade. But generally, a bigger blade is better if you can handle it. There's a lot of different kinds of knives out there. You want to have a sharp knife. It'd be nice to have a knife that keeps its edge. Is a ceramic knife automatically better than a metallic knife? No, not at all. There are quality ceramic knives and there are low-cost ceramic knives. And just because it's ceramic does not make it better. The citrus juicer is a tool that I use almost every day. Now, I juice my citrus. A lot of the pulp falls into the juice. So I'm fine with that. If there's excess pulp up on top, I eat that or add it to a salad dressing or put it into some other recipe. We end up eating the whole food, the edible portion. But I like to juice my citrus because I then use that citrus juice in an endless number of recipes from salad dressings where it's where it's just the best citrus juice to drinking it plain to blending it with mango or blending it with peach today the donut peaches were just spectacular blended with orange juice just those two ingredients blend drink done. I had close to a gallon. <laughs> Do I use a citrus juicer in any way that's particularly odd or unusual? Well, not, not really. I don't think so. I don't use it as a massage tool or anything, although you could. But I certainly put lemon, lime, orange, grapefruit, tangerine. <laughs> tangerine juice is just spectacular. And occasionally, you can use the citrus juicer on other types of fruit. If you wish, for instance, if you slice a tomato in half and then put it on top of the citrus juicer, you can control how much of the middle of the tomato you take out and how much you leave. For instance, if you wish to make stuffed tomatoes, it's an easy way to do it. I'm particularly fond 
of an immersion blender because it doesn't create the cavitation that downflux of air into the food you're drinking. So it doesn't oxidize the food. It doesn't leave it full of, full of air if you don't want it full of air. Sometimes there's things that you want to make lighter and fluffier. Sometimes you don't. A lot of people find that that inclusion of air, for instance, if you take bananas in water and blend them, that including the air affects the flavor just a little bit. If you take the same amount of water and the same amount of bananas and use an immersion blender, sometimes referred to as a stick blender or a wand, they find that the flavor is actually different. But what's even more noticeable is that if you take a glass of each, Vitamix blend bananas and water, immersion blend bananas and water, same quantities of both, pour them both into a cup, and then or a clear glass, and check them again in 30 minutes, and check them again in an hour. The immersion blender drink will be basically the same color as it was when you started. The Vitamix will have gone very dark, like an apple does after you cut it. This is oxidative damage. It's a small but measurable loss of nutrients. I'm using the immersion blender for the texture that I can create and not really worrying so much about nutrition. I'm eating a diet of whole fresh ripe organic foods. I'm not worrying that much about nutrition. The nice thing about immersion blenders is they come in different sizes. At our events we have an immersion blender large enough so that we can blend 10 gallons of soup all at one time. And it does a great job on 10 gallons. That's a big pot. There are even bigger ones than that. And smaller ones in gradations all the way down to a little handheld stick blender home unit. Whatever you get, it's well worth trying the immersion blender because it will do it will do quantities that are essentially too small for a powerful blender like a Vitamix to even bother with. I mean you put in small quantities and it ends up below the blades. You can't even do it in a Vitamix. And yet in an immersion blender you certainly can. I like playing with my food and I like presenting it in different ways. And so I enjoy using mold. There's a tremendous number of kinds of molds, from cookie cutters to these, what are sometimes referred to as a burger press. Uh, there are all sorts of molds available. And I think one of the, one of the things I like about a mold, especially a pressable mold, is that I can put the food in the mold and then squeeze as hard or as gently as I want. If there's excess moisture, if there's what I mean, I was doing vegetables the other day in a mold that makes five at a time little cylinders, short cylinders, about an inch and a half tall and an inch across, and it makes five at a time. Well, I can put the vegetables in and make those five cylinders and serve them as little, I call them tots, but I can serve those tots and if I don't squeeze very hard they certainly take the shape of the mold but it's a very wet product. If I squeeze seriously then I can drive the water out, it'll all fall out, I have a bowl underneath and let the, all the liquid fall into that bowl and then I have cylinders that are in fact quite dry about the way I want them. If I want them dry, wet, if I want them wet. And I end up with an extra course because I can end up with all that vegetable juice that I've hand squoze out of the vegetables and either use that in a different dish or serve it as its own course. Lots of things you can do with mold and I think 
one of the most powerful is the fact that you can create symmetry whether that's for your salad or a slaw served in a symmetrical mold or just the fact that if you're serving a hundred of them that they can all look identical and when you're plating up a hundred of something it's rather nice to see them all look the same it's really pleasing it gives gives the consumer an excellent feeling I've tried every kind of dehydrator on the market from solar dehydrator cylinders and and angled tubes to stackable dehydrators and circular ones they all have some good things about them but none of them can touch the Excalibur dehydrator Excalibur dehydrator just does the job it's really brilliant you can control the temperature you can have a timer if you want things to go off or not if you don't and you can control the dehydration from just a few minutes of sweating a product to half an hour to an hour of wilting it a bit it's very nice to wilt lettuce if that's the texture you want uh, to heightening the flavor of various fruits or vegetables by leaving them in the dehydrator for two or three hours if you want to make full-on dehydrated food you can I almost never do that but I do use my dehydrator as a kitchen tool for making tonight's dinner and I might not start it until two in the afternoon and then put it in the dehydrator for two or three hours and it's just enough moisture driven off that the flavor is heightened the texture is changed it's a fun tool to play with and certainly well within 80 10 10 parameters I like the flexible cutting mat because it's quiet when you cut on it because it's easy to clean in the sink and because once I've chopped up whatever I'm chopping I can curl the mat and walk with it easily even if I just wish to dump it into a Vitamix or into a food processor by curling the cutting mat all the food comes out in a controlled fashion rather than tipping a wooden board or a glass board or a plastic board that it's really hard to get the food off so I enjoy having flexible cutting mats plus they travel so easily and lightly I just think they're way cool here's a winner the mandolin if you've never used a mandolin please let me warn you that not only are they a lot of fun but pretty much anybody who uses a mandolin more than once is likely to cut themselves be careful you're sliding food across a razor's edge there are different razor edges on the mandolin some of them curved and some of them flat but you're sliding it past a razor edge you can make waffle cut vegetables you can make noodles you can make controlled every slice exactly the same at any width you wish you can reproduce the same ones a month later getting the exact same cuts it's a it's a marvelous tool it's easy to use it's easy to clean I think I have three or four different mandolins in my house and I actually use different ones for different jobs I love making noodles with my mandolin but I also greatly enjoy making even thickness slices of say a zucchini that I can then put a sauce on top and serve it up as finger food how much well a lot of people do weigh their food before every meal and unless you have medical reasons to do that I'm not a big fan of it but if you want to create a recipe that you can reproduce later on you almost have to weigh the food just saying one banana 
I mean, there's little bananas, there's big bananas. One apple, one strawberry, it's, well, I guess it depends on how precise you want to be. But if you want to add, say, 25 grams or 28 grams of sunflower seeds into, an, into a recipe so that you know exactly how much fat, carbohydrate, and protein you're putting in to your food in order to create recipes that one you can reproduce and two other people can reproduce the kitchen scale a great tool so if you think about it my top five tools include the food scale the mandolin the flexible cutting mats Excalibur dehydrator molds immersion blender citrus juicer large knife food processor and a Vitamix blender along with your Julian peeler. That should keep you going for a while. We're here tonight to talk about Culinary Skills Week and where do you need to improve your culinary skills? I don't know. Maybe you just want to have a better understanding of food combining so that you get the most nutrition because you got the best digestion. Maybe you want to learn a lot more about food ripening and food storage. Which foods store cold? Which foods store warm? How long? How When are they ripe? What do I have to do to prevent fruit flies? Maybe you want to expand your recipe repertoire and learn dozens and dozens, hundreds of new recipes are demonstrated or talked about at Culinary Skills Week. If you're interested to create desirable dishes, you know, you come home and, and you find out what's in the house and that's what's available and can you make dinner with this? Well, yeah, sure. Or do you say, no, I can't, I have to go shopping first. It'd be nice to be able to just say, okay, here's what you get, now make it into a meal. And we show you how to do that. We show you how to make custom meal plans for various types of athletes, for people in different types of ill health, for special needs, geriatric, pediatric, no teeth, whatever it might be, or even for people who have taste preferences or allergies. We want to show you how to make custom meals and still stay within the 80-10-10 parameters for all of that while being able to explain to the people for whom you made the food why you're making it the way you're making it. Of course if you just want to broaden your kitchen skills come to Culinary Skills Week. I mean you'll spend a lot of time in the kitchen with our best 80-10-10 trained food and sports chefs. The ones that do our events year in and year out and they're there to share their information with you. So we took a poll, hopefully all of you played, and gave us a little bit of a response on the poll, and I've addressed those needs specifically. Kevin, are you out there? Can you tell us how the poll went tonight? Certainly, Dr. Graham. The number one response was expanding my recipe repertoire. Uh, coming in second, there's a few tie, there's a tie for second. Um, with understanding food combining <clears throat> and possessing a knowledge of best food ripening and storage uh, methods. People are really describing Culinary Skills Week to the nth degree. Everyone gets a chance to make food at Culinary Skills Week and so you get to see not only your own practice improve but you get to watch everyone else at Culinary Skills Week making food. And so a tremendous number of recipes are brought to light using the same foods. Then we get to work in teams. You get practice leading the team, you get practice being part of the team, and depending on where your skill set falls best, uh, again, making recipes that other people dictate. 
and it's it's just by the time you go home you are a changed person in the kitchen you literally become kitchen magician what happens at culinary skills week we build a range of enticing dishes from fast and simple to time-consuming and complex and you get practice in the classroom figuring out how is that going to happen then in the kitchen actually making it happen we're going to gain command of the 80 10 10 lifestyle in a comfortable supportive environment where we take you through classes to make sure with our immersion techniques that you live the part every day at culinary skills week we teach you how to make food management quality control quantity control portion control and food combinations as automatic as breathing in and out by covering it in the classroom and then going into the kitchen and doing those exact same things a second time we cover the theory we cover the practical and by the time you've done it every day for a week it's automatic we're going to teach you to tantalize your friends and family with simply delicious 80 10 10 raw vegan dishes that are tried and true tested to perform well we're going to show you the ones that we know always work and give you those to take home we're going to teach you how to understand the art of ambiance you will be doing the ambiance but we have professional help there as well the importance of plating and how to make that heighten and enhance the quality of the food you serve and other key ingredients in presentation so that your food comes across as good as it possibly can there doesn't need to be any downsides we're going to teach you how to use a dehydrator to heighten flavors and to broaden your scope of textures and again in the classroom describe what happens so that you you have a working knowledge and then do it in the kitchen we have a, a wall of dehydrators to use and practice with so you can see what happens and do the experiments and then work with it that way you will gain confidence that you can prepare healthy tasty meals that you can please your guests no matter who they are even if they're family and even if they're not well you can be sure that you're making food that will fit their special dietary requirements if you're looking for new recipes come to culinary skills week if you want new cuisine ideas how to make oriental food how to make middle age middle eastern food how to make food of different ethnic cultures if you want more ideas to do with food how to carry themes through your food come to culinary skill week if you want to make your food beautiful and just absolutely rich with flavor learning which different foods hide each other and which ones augment each other's tastes culinary skills week if you want to know how to make sure you always have the right amount of right produce in your house we're going to practice and do it at culinary skills week and of course if just overall you want to take a quantum leap in your ability to produce fantastic 80 10 10 gourmet food come to culinary skills week our retreat center is in Cedra Woolly Washington just north of Seattle it's a beautiful place in a beautiful setting with all the facilities that we need a huge open kitchen we've got new building going up this year just to make sure that even if the weather is horrendous 
course, we're going in September. It's the best weather of the year traditionally, but we're ready for anything. We've built a new building this year just to make sure that we can work with people in the small groups that we really want to while we're accepting only a few people into each retreat. 16 is the absolute max for Culinary Skills Week. We'll have at least half of that many there working to assist you in making sure that you get the custom hand holding that you really need. But we can go walk in the woods, we can go swim in the river, we can take a hike up a mountain, it's all right there. We have really nice cush, comfortable living room, couldn't be more home style, bedrooms, couldn't be more plush. We want you to feel well taken care of. Of course, we're going to make food, and we're going to make the food look pretty, taste fantastic, appeal to all of your senses, and we'll show you the tricks that make that easy for you. Ah, oh, falafel. Banana pie? I mean, these foods are not served every day in most 80-10-10 homes, but they can be if you enjoy making food for your family. If you just want to throw them an apple and say, eat it, fine. But if you want to make nice things for a party, for a group at work, for just entertaining in any way, for an event, maybe for a seminar, maybe for a living, come to Culinary Skills Week. We'll teach you how to make food that will astonish your friends and please everyone who tries it. We'll show you what it takes to make the food irresistible. A lot of people think they can resist whole, fresh, ripe, raw, organic fruits and vegetables, but not when you make it look and taste appealing. Alicia Ojeda is a classically trained chef with a breadth and depth of experience more than 20 years and has probably has, I can don't even say probably, Alicia Ojeda has more chef experience than any raw food chef in the world. The girl is astonishing. She's, in, she's got eyes behind her head. She knows everything that's going on in her kitchen. Her managerial skills are second to none. She's worked in situations where she was making breakfast, lunch, and dinner for 14,000 people at each meal every day. Katie Crane, Chef Katie Crane, has been our head chef at various food and sport events, including the fasting in Costa Rica, where she's making food for 10 for the first four weeks and for 30 for the last couple of weeks. Our walking tour in Costa Rica, and she's co-authoring with me our Simply Delicious recipe book series. The e-books are out already, and if you haven't seen the 801010 Simply Delicious ebooks, please check them out. Culinary Skills Week schedule is pretty simple. There's theory in the classroom every day. There's practical in the kitchen every day. We start out with a lot of theory and a little practical. We finish with a little theory and a lot of practical. As your skills improve and the amount that you're willing to take on in the kitchen grows. From definitions and food combining, caloronutrients to food storage, on through meal planning and special needs and problem solving, we cover everything in a week of lecture material. Go over into the kitchen and put those exact things into practice so you learn to see the kitchen like the pro chef does and handle the produce like a pro chef does. Get a little practice under your belt 
making a dinner. And then finally, learn and develop not only your teamwork skills, but your leadership skills in the kitchen to make massive meals as a group. It's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. And it's a tremendous amount of personal growth in the area of culinary skills. It's quickly becoming the most popular of all the Food and Sports Cedra Woolly events. Culinary Skills Week has so many people talking about it, so many people wanting to attend. You go home with a repertoire of new recipes and 80-10-10 cuisine concepts. New kitchen skills from every angle, things you never would have even thought. An appreciation and understanding of how to create awe-inspiring ambiance, which may be a part of being a kitchen magician that you had never even considered. It certainly affects you whether the room is orange and blue or gray and red and what type of music is playing in the background. If you want to master your food combining principles and learn how to construct custom meals, Culinary Skills Week, you'll go home with all of that plus so much more. We'll only have 16 spots available in total. We've already got people registered, but there are still spots open. If you're interested to come to Culinary Skills Week, Register right away. At the end of the day, if you attend an 80-10-10 event, it will change your life in ways you never imagined. The safety alone at our retreats, the acceptance, the feeling of family can't be beat. Just being a week when nobody asks you where do you get your protein is worth it, but so much more will happen than that. We share everything we know in order to help you succeed at reaching your personal goals. Find a way to make it happen. Come to Culinary Skills Week. I promise you won't regret it. And I can tell you this for a fact. Over the decades that I've been running retreats, I've had hundreds of people tell me, I can't come this year, but I'll come next year. So far, not one of those people has ever come to a food and sport event. If you're interested, make it happen this year. We'll help you. We'll help you figure out a payment plan or give you ideas of how to raise the funds. We want you to be there. We want you to join the Food and Sport family. I look forward to seeing you at Culinary Skills Week or any of the other Cedra Woolly events this September and October. Put it on your schedule. Make it happen. Come to help. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking about Culinary Skills Week. I hope to meet you at food and sport events this summer in Cedra Woolley, Washington, and welcome you in to the food and sport family. Thanks for being here with me. This is Dr. Doug Graham wishing you all a great day.